Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, December 3rd, 2015, and this is the week in charts. This week's Week in Charts is brought to you by WebinarSoon.com. There's Webinar Soon. All right, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I could quickly sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Before we get started, a couple of quick announcements in here. First of all, I want to thank the Germans. I had a fantastic trip, and uh, we're going to talk about a few things that I learned from the Germans in today's show. And I'm also going to talk about uh, some uh, following a trading system and uh, finding a trading system. That's going to make a lot more sense, but a lot of things that I um, – learn from them and, and the Germans are not unlike anyone else that I've met in my world travels. Uh, I am going to mention a book. It's the way of the turtle, uh, in this week's, um, presentation. So if you go to my website under, um, on the sidebar of the website, you can see that. In fact, the sidebar is right here. So you go to the homepage and you go to the sidebar, you'll see, uh, the books. If you scroll down a little further, it'll look like that. Uh, I'll get uh, maybe uh, 20 or 30 cents if you buy it, and I'll just toss that into the plate. But um, I appreciate it. And Foresight Hindsight, if you want to follow along my trading service in a uh, inexpensive, in fact, free manner, you could follow the Foresight and Hindsight. It's delayed about a week. depends on whether or not we have a setup that could set up in the uh, delayed version. So um, anyway, so check that out if you get a chance. All right, what do we talk about? Well, I have a dead money report. I want to talk about finding a system and staying with the system or following the system, I should say. This is something that I want to talk about, especially uh, based on my trip to uh, Germany. Now, that'll make a lot more sense in just one second. Uh, volatility cycles and fake outs, a little bit more advanced type of thing, something that I did years ago. I was uh, I went through a phase where I did a lot of volatility research. I was working with Larry Connors many years ago back in the late 90s, and uh, he was sort of enthralled and fascinated with volatility, and that kind of rubbed off on me, and I did a lot of research on my own. And it's kind of interesting. We kind of discovered some things uh, simultaneously, or actually I discovered them, and he later discovered them, or vice versa. I forget who discovered them first, probably simultaneously, um, and that's just the, the strange thing about markets. Uh, anyway, I'll explain that in just one second. Uh, user requests also want to talk about whether or not we're still in a potential bear market or a bear market signals are still relevant. And that's going to make sense when we get to it in just one second. You know, I hate to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'd rather just tell you, hey, we have a dead money report this week. We had to wait a little while for it. But, hey, that's what a dead money is all about, waiting for the signals. Now, what's the definition of dead money? Dead money is a slang term used to... Uh, describe when you're in an investment and there's no chance of it giving you a return. Uh, Investopedia calls it a slang term for, or defines it as, a slang term for money invested in security with minor hopes of appreciating or earning a return. Now, if you know for a fact that the position would never work, then by all means, then you should not stay with the position you should get out the problem is you don't know and that's where you need to just stick with the system and follow the system and that's what you need to do now hang on one second I've got to delete some orders sorry I shouldn't have done this uh, if I should have done this before okay um, so, again, if you knew that the position was not going to work, then by all means get out. But you don't know. And that's something I'm going to touch upon in just one second. You need to let the market make decisions for you. And I'll show you how to do just that in a few seconds. Um, a lot of people, when it comes to trading, tend to trip over the nickels while going for the dollars. Now, one example of that might be literally where you're trying to get that perfect, perfect execution in a method that doesn't require a perfect, perfect execution. So my method really doesn't require a perfect, perfect execution. Some methods, if you're in and out all day and you're not getting that extra nickel and that slippage or whatever, then you're going to lose money in the system. Some people could trade those systems. Some people can. The difference might not be your mentality. It might just be your 
execution system. But in my system, that's not important, or not nearly as important, I should say. I mean, you do want to get good fills, but it's not nearly as important as if uh, if you're trading some system like that. So the point is, what I'm trying to make today is that you don't want to exit a position at a tiny profit or a tiny loss because you're thinking that you're saving something. You want to just follow the system to its end. Every trade is going to have a beginning, a middle, and the end. And the way you stay with that trade is just make it a passive decision. Let that stop either keep you in or take you out. And I'm going to flesh that out in a lot more details when we talk about systems. Now, this week's dead money report is on MOH. And this is a position we've been in for quite a while. In fact, all the way since uh, late last September, it triggered right here. And you could see that initially it was profitable, looked pretty good, and then it kind of went back to being unprofitable, just kind of meandered around, profitable, unprofitable, profitable, break it even, profitable. And then finally, it begins to implode. And this was kind of cool. This was the first day I was speaking in, um, in Germany. I, show, I showed the slide right here, and uh, somebody said, hey, it's down about uh, six bucks. And I'm like, oh, all right, that's cool. So that looks uh, that's always fun to show something it actually happened, actually have it happen in real time. And that's why, by the way, that's why I've got the delayed service out there so you could see everything. I'd say 95% or more of the examples that I show in the week of charts come straight from my trading service, good, bad, and indifferent, warts and all. So the good thing is you could watch that in hindsight, okay, but you could see them and see things unfold today so you can look back one week on the service and then you can see what's happening today so you'll see that um, in a few days on the trading service you're going to see what this profit target gets hit hopefully that makes sense but anyway it's an easy way to follow along now this is about 30 something days in a trade okay well keep in mind that the market doesn't always move in your time frame but that's about a 15 percent move and that's better than the poke in the eye especially when the stock market hasn't done anything on a net net basis in a long long time Russell 2000 hasn't done anything in a couple of years okay so if you annualize that out it comes to 110 percent which isn't bad now granted I know it's a short side so you can't go past 100 percent but you get the idea it's a lot of money in a very short period of time does dead money include funds parked in money market accounts while waiting for a trend to develop I'm almost 100 percent in cash now uh, I wouldn't call that dead money. I'd call that smart money. You know, that's part of following your system, which we're going to get into in, in quite a bit of detail. Don't feel pressure to put that money to work. Now, put it to work, I shouldn't say. I should use that phrase, to work. Don't feel pressure to put that capital into harm's way. If you go in and watch the video I did, I might have done more than one now, but uh, way back in September when this market started getting a little iffy, I pointed out that cash is not trash. There's nothing wrong with sitting on some cash. I know we're supposed to be traders and we're supposed to be doing all this trading and that's how we make money. But sometimes return of capital, as they say, is a lot more important than return on capital. So don't feel the pressure to do something unless there's something to do. And I've been telling my peeps this quite a bit at the trading service because we don't have a whole lot on We've got a couple of positions on, uh, MOH and NK. MOH is a short, NK is a long. And I've been telling everyone, you know, don't feel pressure to to make a lot of trades and, and quote, unquote, put that money to work because right now is not the time to do that. But I'm going to have just the opposite problem, and I've been saying this to my peeps too, I'm going to have just the opposite problem when things get really good. Everybody's like, Dave, I can't keep up. There's too many positions. There's too much going on. So just wait. When conditions are good, you're going to be swamped with positions. In fact, you know, it's like now I'm at a point where I spend two to three hours trying to figure out whether there's something to trade. And at the end of it all, I don't ha I have nothing or maybe just one. Whereas when conditions are really good, I might spend a considerable amount of time, maybe not quite so much time, but a considerable amount of time deciding between setups. Usually, as I think I've said quite a bit, even though I go through all these stocks every night, even though I'm doing hours and hours of research or market analysis, however you want to do it, when conditions are good, within the first few minutes of going through my database, I pretty much know 
what I'm going to trade and everything else is just sort of like confirmation and make sure I didn't miss anything else. But when conditions are good, you don't, it doesn't really take a lot of time. It's pretty easy and those setups should pretty much jump right out at you. So yeah, don't feel the pressure about sitting in cash. Nothing wrong with cash. I know it kind of sucks right now because uh, interest rates are kind of low, but uh, just be happy that you could wake up tomorrow and that cash will still be there. Okay. So that's this week's dead money report. Took forever to work, but uh, so far, knock on wood, so good on that one. Any questions on dead money and following the system? So how do you follow your system? Well, you wait until you're either stopped out or you hit the initial profit target and you begin trailing your stop lower. So in this particular case, we had a stop. The entry was here. And the stop was about somewhere in here somewhere. Okay. And then the profit target was here, initial profit target. And now the trailing stop is now to here. Okay. About 66, I believe. So if it comes back up and stops out, then you get what I call the better than a poke in the eye trade. Okay. At least you made something. And if it does it, you're able to stick with hopefully what will turn into a longer term winner. Okay. Any questions on that before we move on? Now, this is kind of a busy slide. It kind of got busier and busier as I um, was putting to get my, together my presentation. So when I was in Germany, kind of a, a very interesting thing happened in one of my short sessions. We had... Uh, two traders in there, and they were actually trading partners. And it was pretty cool because one was a former uh, world champion uh, poker player. He's played, he's a world champion, I think, in Austria. Uh, he's played in Las Vegas, and he's now entering the trading world. And guess what? He's really good at trading. He's a really good trader. It was fascinating to meet this individual. And I think the reason he's really good is he's, he knows when to hold them. He knows when to fold them, right? No, more importantly, he knows when sometimes you should you should just sit it out. And and you know, I just made a joke of knows when to hold and fold, but uh, that's probably pretty important too. So not only does he know when to stay out, but he knows how to follow his system. He would not be um, world champion. I'm not sure if he's like number one world champion, but he's ranked uh, very high, like second and third in Las Vegas and. Uh, certainly a uh, country champion of Austria and some other places. So uh, I wish I'd have gotten, been able to get some more information from him, but I was whisked away to do an interview right afterwards, but fascinating individual. And he's doing really well. Now his trading partner is not doing so well. Okay. Now they have the both, they both have the same exact system. So the problem of knowing whether or not a system works, which is a huge problem. And the more I think about it, that's why this slide kind of, became so busy as I was getting ready for the presentation. But that problem has completely been removed from the equation. So he already knows it's a workable system. But this sort of got me thinking, kind of backing things out a little bit uh, to not f following the system, which we'll get to in just a few minutes, but that system discovery process. Okay. So before you could actually follow a system You've got to ask yourself some really tough questions. Can you, or, or do you, I should say, believe in the system in the first place? Does it fit your psyche? Okay. Now, a lot of people are more excited about being right than making money. And so trading a system where you're not going to be right a lot can be tough. But maybe that's what you should be doing but a lot of people have this need to be right so maybe a more accurate system might fit their psyche a little better unfortunately and i don't want to digress too far there's some problems inherent with that because you're not making enough money for the occasional big hits but you have to make sure that it fits your psyche that you could actually trade the system now i thought it was kind of interesting uh it kind of brings me back to curtis faith and, and his book was the way of the turtle and it's not a book that you're going to read and go, oh, yeah, I gotta, I'm, you know, I've got this system for the book. I can't wait to run out and trade it. But what it is going to give you is going to give you some, some insight to a trader's mind. I think it's more of a trading psychology type of book. And it's kind of funny. We talked about the, the dead money thing a few minutes ago. 
And what was cool about the turtles, and what uh, Larry McMillan actually recommended I read it because he was he was talking at one of our conferences. He was talking about the fact that they had a ping pong table. And that's why I decided to read the book because I kind of felt like, eh, I'm not going to read those turtle books. I, I kind of – I know the story. I know what happened. But anyway, it was, it's, it's a worthwhile read, so definitely read the book. And they had a ping pong table because there, there were plenty of times where there was nothing to do. So instead of trading yourself into a hole trying to make something happen, which I think we've all been guilty of here and there. I've got too many screens on right now. Um, I occasionally get sucked into the siren call of a day trade. Okay, I, I admit that. But I preach. <laughs> I suggest that you don't. And I, I keep myself extremely busy so I don't fire off too many day trades or, or, or take trades that I shouldn't be taking versus following the system. But anyway, the Curtis Faith book, they actually – he talked about they had a ping pong table. And they became probably semi-pro professional ping pong players because they played ping pong most of the time instead of trading most of the time. And I would imagine – I'm guessing it's been a while since I read the book. But I would imagine that a lot of the times they were already in positions and it was nothing to do with the positions other than weight. So they play ping pong. And they even had uh, tournaments and, and their, um, within the, with, between the traders. The book is on my shelf. Have not read it yet. Well, Frenchie, take it down and read it. Okay. <laughs> now, what's kind of interesting about Curtis Faith, and, and, and I talk, and I don't want to pick on anyone because we're not immune. I mean, trust me, I have my own scars, and, and we're, no one's going to get out alive, right, <laughs> in this business. But but if you can survive long enough, you can learn to accept the risk and know the risks you're taking, and you'll do fine. But we all seem to have to go through this discovery process and, and learn and get our ass handed to us a few times to learn about risk. So I don't want to take anything away from Mr. Faith because what he did was quite incredible. But he's taken some criticism because he did blow up. And a lot of these famous trend followers, and that's why I'm always talking about why I've developed a hybrid system. Because if you're a pure longer-term trend follower, you're going to be wrong about 70 to 80% of the time. And then your drawdowns are going to be abysmal. And you might print money over a period of time, but they could be there will be extended times where you won't make any money. In fact, you could lose a substantial amount of money too, to both open profits and to the fact that, that that your inaccuracy is so huge. And that's why I take this hybrid approach where we go in for a swing trade and then hopefully stick around for a longer term trade. I don't have a perfect system. I don't think anyone does. Uh, if they did, they'd have the holy grail. But the point I want to make is a lot of these famous longer term trend followers have subsequently blown up. And what, what I like about Curtis Faith is that he's willing to talk about it. And in an interview, he said, a lot of people say, how could you lose so much money? And then the point is, what they didn't realize is that I never would have made that money in the first place. And I'm just kind of paraphrasing here. But the point is that he had the proper mindset. A lot of the turtles failed, but he was hugely successful because he was able to follow the system both good and bad. Now, I was a little hesitant to put this in to this presentation because I didn't want you to rush out and think, well, I could go trade this system that has 50% drawdowns and these huge drawdowns or whatever. But the point is that he had the proper mindset to begin with and he could actually follow such a system, which printed money and made a tremendous amount of money. And then unfortunately, because of the negative aspects of the system, longer term, I guess the odds caught up and it, it just did, it didn't work longer term. But the point is that he had the proper mindset to follow the system. I have people – well, you know, if you have a system and you want me to analyze it and you think about emailing it to me, don't, okay? Because, number one, I don't want to get into that business because I already have a system that I've spent 20-something years working on. And I'm still working on it, okay? It's a work in progress. But I think I've got something that, that works fairly well here. But – if you do send me something, be prepared for me to rip it apart a little bit. And what's interesting is I think if you are to develop a system, the people who are successful in developing a system not only look for the good, but they look for what could go wrong. What 
is the bad? What could what could happen? And someone emailed me a system, and I was like, well, you know, you draw it out a little steep, and they're going back and forth. They're arguing with me on it. And I'm like, well, look, you know, you had a 40-something percent drawdown this year, and this is this is in a, this is in a hypothetical system in hindsight. And I actually got a, an interesting argument with someone once, or debate, I should say. I explained to them, I said, well, you know, in system following, your biggest drawdown is always ahead of you. And they got mad at me. Well, think about it. Everything is in perfect hindsight. And if your system has a 50% drawdown in perfect hindsight, chances are it might have an even bigger drawdown in reality. But anyway, you have to think about what could go wrong. So the point I'm trying to make is that this system had a 40-something percent drawdown, and that's in perfect hindsight, okay? In perfect hindsight, you could build some incredible systems, certainly with much less drawdowns than that. And I said, could you could you live through that drawdown? And if you're trading clients' money, then obviously if you're trading a fund, if you lose more than half, you're blown up, okay, for all intents and purposes. I guarantee you – your clients will, will shut down on you. <laughs> Shoot, if you don't even if you don't beat the S and P by a huge amount, your clients will leave you. Okay, so there's no way your clients are going to tough out that drawdown. So now, if you're just a private trader, could you really sit through that drawdown? And I, I guess Mr. Fate did a few times and he made all this money, but that'll work until it don't, and that's another conversation altogether. And his point was, the, the gentleman who was defending his system was, yeah, but by the end of the year, it was actually up a few percent. It's like, well, could you have really traded through that drawdown? Maybe Curtis Faith could, okay, but I certainly could not have, okay? So be willing to pick apart the negative. And if you do want me to help you build your system, I'll charge $1,000 an hour. That, that'll be the best money you ever spent because I'll rip it apart and I'll save you – thousands of dollars in real time by figuring out what your real risks are in the system. But I don't want to digress too far. The point is, don't email me systems. <laughs> now, the question is, do you believe in the system? Okay. So you really have to believe in what you're doing. And it has to, again, fit your psyche. And if you firmly believe in what you're doing, if you've analyzed the risk and you've seen the good, the bad, and the indifferent, which I'm going to flesh out in quite a few details in just a minute, then maybe the system will work for you. But you also have to ask yourself, does it fit your lifestyle? I knew a doctor who was making day trades off a laptop in the rooms where he was examining people. So he'd walk over, make some day trades, and, and examine people. Day trading didn't really fit his lifestyle, okay? Well, he, he was either going to have to quit being a doctor or quit being a day trader, but you can't do both. Now, I don't want to digress too far, but I think that my style, you can you could do both. You could be a businessman or a doctor or whatever, and you could still trade because you're not in and out all day long. A lot of the times you're just going to be waiting. In fact, as I as I preach ad nauseum, if you are going to trade, especially my system, then keep yourself busy. And I keep myself extremely busy. In fact, today I just realized I promised someone I'd write a chapter for their book. And I, I'm scared to even look at my schedule. I know it's due in December, and I've got so much that's happening towards the end of the year right now. I don't know how I'm going to do it all. I mean, I'm to a point now where I'm thinking, like, can I even continue these weekly shows? And it's like, you know what, Dave, just keep doing it all because that staying busy is going to keep you from firing off those day trades. It's going to keep you from sticking – it's keep you sticking to the plan, okay? So you really need to know the nuances of the system. And this is good, and this is – Bad, and this is a different. Michael says, "Give up sleep." <laughs> well, I tell you, it's like to a point now where it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, I, earlier in my career, I felt like sleep was a waste of time, and then I finally realized that I might need to get some. But yeah, I mean, I'm still jet lag and got a little cold or something happening, and a um, little burnout from all the travels and all. But that's good though. I like keeping myself busy, so I'm not going to do those those stupid things. <laughs> but yeah, I've often thought about that. I actually tried once to just meditate instead of sleeping, but then I'm, I'm getting a little older now and I realize that, hey, I need my rest. 
So you have to, before I digress too far, you have to know the nuances of your system. And can you accept them good, bad, and indifferent? And it's kind of weird. The, the good problem is when things are really great. Unfortunately, that can kind of go to your head. And I don't want to go off too far on a tangent. Imagine that. But somebody once wrote that they could, it might have been uh, Paul Tudor Jones, wrote that he could publish his trading system on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and it wouldn't affect his fund's performance because people wouldn't follow it. Now, I have personally witnessed this when my trading service is printing money, okay? Because people think, okay, I'm going to leverage up. This just prints money. Um, I have people tell me, oh, I'm going to quit my job. No, don't quit your job. You know, we're having a good, good period now, but I can't promise it will always be this good. But people leverage up. They begin to front run the signals, okay? So I say, okay, here's your entry at $25 and stocks at 23 or 22 or 21. They're getting dead. They're getting in early. They're trying to beat the system. So when things are going good, obviously that's a good problem to have. But that's a whole different set of problems. There's a whole different set of problems that comes with that. People begin to, their ego begins to take over, and they try to beat the system. Now, the bad is, can you accept the occasional losing trades? That's going to be an any methodology, okay? If you're longer-term trade following, it's going to be pretty much really horrible. So that's tough, tough, tough to accept. But... You know, you look at some of these guys, I'm not going to pick on anyone, but some of these value guys, these famous value guys that everybody writes about, is all impressed with, and you can actually plot their stocks, okay? They've lost over half of their money throughout it, during per periods of history. I don't know how they could survive and keep trading, but obviously that's what they do, and they don't care if they lose over half of their money. So... That's the bad. You need to wrap your head around the bad and know how you would handle the bad. Um, you know, I was kind of I was listening to that interview earlier about Curtis Faith, and he said that uh, people, when it comes to following a system, they might follow a system ninety five percent of the time, but that remaining five percent is the difference from them being successful. And not successful. Those winning trades at that five percent might be what's keeping them from becoming successful. If you have a system where it depends on the occasional big outlier, and my system is somewhat like that, you can occasionally chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it. We had a real good streak a couple of years back where we were like a hundred percent for an extended period of time correct. But we weren't really making a lot of money, okay? We were making like 1% overall in the account and then stopping out. It was a lot of uh, small gains and stop outs. Well, that's not my favorite way to trade. It looks good and it kind of feels good because you're kind of making money consistently. But that's not how it works, Beatrice, longer term. The way the methodology works longer term is to capture those few occasional outliers. So like Mr. Faith said, if you're not following that 5% of the time, that might be the difference between your success and not being successful. As I've said a thousand times, I'll say a thousand more, I've had some really good periods in the service where people quit. Well, why do you quit? I can't make any money. Okay, well, did you get this whatever, ABC trade? No, I didn't take that one. It's like, oh, okay. Well, did you get this other trade, other big trade? No, I didn't take that one. But they took the four or five other trades that were losing trades, trades that I have long forgotten about because we've got these big winners that are taking care of all those losses and then some. So the point there is, can you handle the bad? Can you sit either right now, sit on your hands and not take a whole lot of action while the market finds its way, okay? Or be willing to put your ego aside. If you see a couple of shorts setting up as the market's kind of rolling over here, take them. But for the most part, sit on your hands. Can you do that? A lot of people can't. A lot of people crave action. So that's the bad. And the indifferent is, can you grind it out? And this could be the tough part. It's like you make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little. And you wonder if you're ever going to make any serious money ever. And Brian Gelber once said, I think this was in Market Wizards, 
This is my view of a year in the life of the trader. Four out of 12 months, you're hot. You're so excited that you can't sleep at night. You just can't wait to get up to work the next day. You're just rolling. Two months out of the year, you're cold. You're so cold, you're miserable. You can't sleep at night. You can't figure out when the next trade is going to come from. And the other six months of the year, you make and lose, make and lose, make and lose. And that's the tough part. You have to realize that good times follow bad, but unfortunately, vice versa. And then I think the bottom line is, as I've said quite a bit, as my wife once said, and I'm not going to tell the story because I've told it a thousand times, how many trading systems do you really need? You need one. You need one that you're going to follow. Okay. So getting back to my German brethren. Hello, Renee. I see you. <laughs> we have we have one person in there from uh, that was at the seminar. Good to see you, buddy. Um. So let's say you you do find a viable system. In this particular case, that, that in the one seminar that uh, I gave over there, one of the short sessions, there were, again, these two guys. One was successful and one wasn't. Same system, okay? Well, my advice to him was, first of all, get small, okay? So cut your trading size in half. And if you're not trading properly at half, they cut your size in half again, okay? You have to trade at a size where it's almost meaningless, where you're not monetizing those clicks on the screen, those ticks on the screen, I should say, into something tangible. You have to just trade at a size that's almost meaningless to you. And then once you, once you start following the system, then slowly up your size. You have to be consistent in doing that, though. As I, as I said in Germany also, you can't risk 2% and then get frustrated and then risk a quarter percent and then you make a huge big winner and then you like go back to 2% and then you lose and now you've got to make eight more trades or however it, it takes to get back to break even if you're just trading at a quarter percent and then jump up to 2% then lose. That could be a very vicious cycle too. You know, If you are going to drop down a quarter percent, stay at a quarter percent until you're successful and profitable for a considerable amount of time and then maybe bump it to a half percent and then stay at a half percent for a considerable amount of time and then work it from there. As I wrote in the layman's guide to trading stocks, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. Now, the caveat I want to add to that is, provided, of course, you've done your research, you've done your homework, you've found the system, and you've studied the system inside and out, and then you begin paper trading it. But at, at the essence of trading, if you are, I don't know if that's the right way of putting it, but if you are, if you're paper trading a system, a viable system, then I can almost guarantee that you're going to be successful in doing that. It's when real money comes into play that things can get um, tough. So it gets small to a point where if you have to even paper trade it for a while, then do that. Also, you need to give yourself, this is something I just was thinking about uh, a few seconds ago. You do have to give yourself ample amount of time. There have been people, uh, I kind of know some morbid stories. I don't want to get into it. I don't want to bum everybody out. But there have been successful people that, that have uh, just flat out you know, quit on life because they thought they should be making more money. And I don't want to get into that, but it's I, I, I kind of backed into it on accident. But you have to give yourself enough time to where you capture some good momentum cycles. And that's why I'm always telling people, don't come in and trade my service for a month or two months, okay? Make sure you're giving it an ample amount of time so you're capturing these occasional big winners and you're actually going to make money and you're not coming in out of phase and then going off to chase rainbows. <clears throat> now, if you can't follow the system, then what you need to do on your next trade and only that next trade, okay? Here's the deal. If you can't make one trade, one trade following a system, then maybe you shouldn't be trading, okay? But I thought about this this morning. I think anyone who has a true burning desire, and somebody once said uh, God gives us ways to fulfill them, and I believe that. 
So if you do have a true burning desire to learn how to trade, then in following your system, the next trade, I want you to take that trade. I want you to follow the plan to a T. Do exactly what your system says you should do. There should be no guesswork. If you have a trading system, I'm not saying trade mechanically. That's another conversation altogether. But you should have a methodology, a system in place that you know what should be done. Okay? So you put that, you take the entry when you get it. Some people have trouble entering trades. Some people don't. I've always had a, I've always had the problem of, of, I've never, I'm never afraid to make a trade. And that's probably been to my downfall where I probably, there are times when I could have, um, number one, shouldn't have been so active. Number two, should have waited for, uh, obviously, a better signal. But I've never had that problem. Some people do. So it's hard for me to talk about that problem. But if you do see the signal and it's a bona fide, legitimate signal, then you take it. Then you have to have a stop in place, right? You have to have a place where you know you can be wrong. So maybe actually set that actual stop so the market will take you out. Again, if you let the market make decisions for you, your life gets a lot easier. And I'm going to get to that in just one second. So in the next trade, at just that trade, take that trade. Follow the plan on just that one trade, okay? If you can't trade one trade and follow the system on just that one trade, then I hate to say it, but maybe trading's not for you. But I think if, if it's in you, then you could do it if you had the desire. And then after that trade, whether the outcome is good, bad, or indifferent, and you followed your plan, congratulate yourself, maybe give yourself a little small reward, okay? And then on the next trade, and just that one trade, follow the plan. Rinse and repeat. And as I said a second ago, you want to make decisions, passive ones and not active ones, okay? I had a little... uh I was messing around with something uh, before I went to Vegas for Traders Expo, and I fired off. Admittedly, I did it. Uh, I fired off a little day trade at a currency, and usually I would shut these things down, um, just you know, kind of S and G type of trade. But I had a trailing stop on it. I forgot that I had it on, and I got to Vegas and I logged in, and this position made like three times or four times what I'm doing. It was the biggest. It was the biggest forex day trade I made all year. And the reason it worked was because I had a trailing stop in. I forgot about it, and I let the market make the decisions for me. I've had times when, especially early on in my career, where I put on positions and then literally have left the country. And, and back before cell phones, and we had a spotty sat satellite phone once on a sailboat, and I was trying to check in through that, and it was, it was abysmal at best. But when I got back to the airport, I'm all excited. I grab an IBD, and I'm like, oh, look at all the money I made. Well, what did I do when I got back to the office? I closed everything down, and I would have made five times, maybe ten times the amount if I would have just left it all on and let the market take me out. So we all have to have these hard lessons. Okay, I'm not saying I'm immune. I'm not saying I still don't do stupid stuff either. But if you make those decisions a passive one and not an active one, your life becomes a lot easier. OK, so this is especially true if you've taken that partial profit and you got that stop in place, like the MOH trade, for instance. Having that stop in place is nothing to do. There's, you don't look at the screen. Looking at the screen is not going to help that position one way or the other. Just let things unfold. OK. And it's kind of funny. It's like, you know, I was, I, I've been guilty of watching every little tick of that stupid stock. Before I went to Germany, while well, I was so busy with the presentations and everything, I kind of forgot about it. And then I pulled it up on my slides because I made a slide right before I left. And as I'm talking about it, somebody in the audience says, oh, it's down six points today. So it, it actually hit the profit target while I was giving the speech. And had I been watching every little tick too much, I might have been tempted to get out. OK. So. You have to let the market make decisions for you, and you can do that a lot of times just by putting a stop into place. Oh, also, uh, when you go to enter a position, use a stop to enter a position because sometimes, you know, like I said, I have a problem with this entry thing because sometimes I just want to just jump in, okay, ahead of time. 
But I have trained myself to say, okay, well, I know I want to enter at this level and only this level because I know that that trend may be resuming at that level. That's my entry point. So what I'll do is I'll actually place a stop at that entry. I just, a few minutes ago, I had to uh, pull some orders because they didn't trigger it. Now the, the, uh, the market went the other way. And that's because I had the entry in place that I was going to let myself trigger in during this presentation if that happened. Okay. And if it didn't get hit and, and the pattern changed, then I was going to pull the order. So I pulled the order. Okay. So let that market make that decision for you and then get about, go about your life. My favorite saying, again, is obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. So you can only trade off the left side of the screen, right? So you got a stock that's doing this. You know, you got a nice little pullback setup, whatever you're trading, and a little bow tie, whatever. I'm sorry, you can only trade off the right side of the chart. So this is your chart. This is what your chart looks like. <clears throat> and you're going to enter here. But you should have, you should do all your obsessing before. Because you know, in hindsight, everything this stock has done or this market has done, it doesn't have to be a stock. It can be whatever market you're trading. And you've got – you look for perfection because you're not going to get it out here. Trust me. But if you obsess before you get to the trade, if if that's the best thing out there, and always always weigh, you know, what did Rush once said, not the fat guy, but the, the band, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. And I think there's been some other – more elegant ways of putting that, but always view doing nothing as an option. So if this truly is the best setup and everything looks good and stocks, other stocks in the sector look good, the overall market looks good, and the overall sector looks good, and the odds are stacked in your favor, then you need to take the trade. So what do you do once you get to here? Let's say it triggers nothing. If you have a stop in place, let it stop you out if you're wrong. If it begins to rally and hits the initial profit target, take it, okay? And then get that stop up to break even, and then trail that stop for hopefully a long, long time. I know. It's pretty easy, huh? Well, it's not easy, but it's e easier than most people try to make it. Most people do just the opposite. I've seen so many people trigger in, this thing comes right back in same day. Hey, Dave, I got out of that stock because the stock market was up quite a bit, and that stock ended lower by the end of the day. Something's wrong. Well, something might be wrong, but if you're not willing to stay with the position to see if it's going to work within your time frame, okay, then you're never going to make any money. So obsess again before you get into a trade, not afterwards. And then again, keep yourself busy. Again, you know, <laughs> I thought on my way to Germany – I'm like, oh, I'll get all this work done. I got my laptop ready to go, my new little Surface thing. You know, I'm all excited. And I ended up <laughs> not getting much work done, but actually making to-do list the whole time, realizing how much work that I had to get done. Oh, my goodness, I got to do a chapter for the book. The people in Hong Kong, they want – they want a video. I've got to make some charts for them. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to plan the trip. I've got to call my travel agent. It's like all I did was make a to-do list. It just got bigger. So I just keep myself crazy busy. I like it like that, okay? I'm, I'm always – it drives my wife nuts, which is a short trip, but that's another story. But <laughs> even if I'm sitting around the house, I'm shaking a leg. I'm moving. I'm doing something. I always have to be doing something. It's just the way I'm made. I feel like if I stopped, I would die. I was once overserved once, and I was laying on the couch the next day. Hey, my daughter pointed at me. She goes, I've never seen that before, and I immediately got up, head hurting and everything, when the garage started piddling and started moving around again. It's just it's just the way I am. I'm, I'm like crazy type A. And I know that if I'm staring at that screen all day, I'm going to make too many trades instead of following my plan. I'm going to micromanage myself out of good trades. So find know yourself, and then find a way to keep yourself busy. You know, find a hobby, do some research, spend some time with loved ones, or 
if you're a doctor or if you build buildings, then go out and fix people or build buildings, okay? Now, here's the other thing, too. This system was a very accurate – not accurate. I'm sorry. It was a very um, – well, hopefully it was accurate, but it sounded like a very busy system. It had a lot of signals to it, okay? And here's the thing. In getting back to finding a system that fits your psyche, if you can't take a few signals, then what makes you think you're going to take numerous signals, okay? So one thing I recommended to this gentleman was that maybe put a filter – on the system so you're taking fewer yet better trades. I knew a trader once, and when they would hire trades in, new traders in, the newbies were only allowed to take second entries off of signals. In other words, something would have the trigger and then re-trigger a second time. Okay. Now, the problem with that is you're going to miss a lot of moves that take off with the first move, and you're going to have to pass on a lot of trades. But the good thing to that is you're going to be taking fewer and fewer trades. And if you're not successful taking fewer trades, you're not going to be successful taking more trades. And it's ama what always amazes me, and I watch these people in these grill hunts out there, if you're not successful with one system, you're not going to be successful with 10 systems. And then here's the thing. Just do it, okay? Find one thing, just one thing, like Curly said in City Slickers, you know, one thing. And just do it. Do you make a distinction between paper trading and back testing? Um, well, you know, that, that opens up a whole conversation because the the system people that I admire and respect, they do back testing, but then they also do like uh, forward testing too. Okay. And, and I'm guessing the forward testing is a paper trading. So, um, it's one thing to back test and, and find a system, and then it's another thing to watch it in real time, okay? And you know, somebody somebody emailed me a while back. I don't want to digress too far, but but she had she had found a system and she was following it, but uh, on paper trades, and she she made a mistake. It took a trade that she wasn't supposed to, and I think it actually was profitable. And she was asking me, because it wasn't within the system, should she throw it out? And my answer was no, because you did what you did. You made a mistake, you know, and luckily it worked in your favor. I guess it doesn't matter because it wasn't real money. But it's a teaching example. It's a, it's a teaching moment. So you need to follow that system and paper trade that system initially until you gain confidence in it to put the real money on the line. But if you make a mistake, whether it's a good mistake or a bad mistake, or should I say whether the mistake turns profitable or negative, then you have to count that. You can't say, oh, well, I should have did this because that's where in real life, you know, you can't do that. I should have did this. I should have did that. I mean, I'm dealing with a platform now where stops aren't working like they should. I don't know what's wrong, but I can't, you know, the bottom line is the bottom line. I lost money. It's still my fault. Okay. So you can't say what you should have, could have done. Okay. It all goes off the bottom line. All right. Dave, what do you say? What you're saying all makes sense. A lot of us have not made much or lost money this year. It's logical to be tempted to try another strategy. Absolutely. Absolutely. This has been a tough year, although we, we've done okay. We haven't printed money this year. We've done okay. All right. I don't want to brag because year ain't over yet, and we, you know, we'll see. But we've done okay. But it was not a stellar year, and it was a year that tempted your, that really uh, tested your patience. Okay, it tempted you to do a lot of things that you shouldn't do. But I see it all the time. I mean, that's what kills me in the education business, is to see people come along, and when things are mediocre or even losing, they don't tough it out long enough to reap the fruits of their labor, and they go off to chase rainbows. This year, the market chopped around. Guess what everybody's doing? They're selling options, and they think they found the holy grail. Well, next crash, they're going to get wiped out, and then they're going to go off and search for the next system, and the next system, okay? Is it logical to be tempted to try another strategy? Absolutely. 
Absolutely, because when you go through these quiet periods, you begin to question your system. But here's the thing. This is why I always come back to trend following. The only way to ever make money in a market is to capture a trend. Let me repeat that. The only way to ever make money in a market is to capture a trend. Trends existed. Trends have exist existed throughout history. Tulamania back in the 1600s. I'm almost old enough to remember that. <laughs> Rice bubbles in Japan, 1300s or thousands. I forget which year. South Sea bubble. I mean, they've been <laughs> dot com bubble. They've been these these huge trends over the years, commodity bull markets. And the only way you're ever going to make money is to capture a trend. Now, when stuff when something stops working for a while or you get into that waiting period, you might be tempted to go off and chase rainbows. I suggest you don't. Do research if you have to to keep yourself busy, but be very careful when you begin to implement or if you're thinking about implementing a new system. Um one thing to realize, too, it's kind of like getting back to that hindsight thing or that uh, looking at the system. And it's it's sort of easier for me to talk in terms of mechanical systems, even though I'm not a big fan of mechanical systems. But there are mechanical systems that might have six months or eight months of flat time. And when you're looking at a report over 20 years, you tend to gloss over the fact that there were six months where – it didn't make any money or actually lost money consistently for six months. And if you're looking at the, that bottom line, you're thinking, oh, this is great. Let's trade it. But can you live through those six months? And that's why, regardless of the system, you're going to have to go through a few cycles. Okay? My question is, how do we have conviction or faith in a particular system in order to mentally allow us to stick with it? Thanks. Okay, so how do you stick with the system? Well, you stick with the system through experience. Okay? And in my case, I believe in empirical research, okay? And you can look at your trading records going back from years too, obviously, in actual trading records. So if you have something, and again, trend following is the only way to make money in a market. I'm sorry, I said trend following. I should say capturing a trend. And what better way to capture a trend than through trend following, right? So how do you know not to quit? Well, as long as you have confidence in what you're doing and you've done it long enough and lived through a few good cycles, then everything is going to be okay. But the problem that people have is they live through a bad cycle and they think it doesn't work and it quits and they quit. Or worse, they live through a good cycle and they think it will always be this great. They have that permanent income hypothesis and then they trade themselves into a hole by overtrading with conditions or great. So you're going to have, it's going to take some experience. I mean, I can tell you what to do. I could show you what to do. It gave you some really simple things to follow. And then you can kind of like a muscle kind of build upon that a little bit and maybe get to a little bit more advanced things. But it seems like we all have to go on this Holy grail hunt before we begin to get it. And we begin peeling off all those indicators and go back to something simple. So yeah, it's tough. I mean, I'm not going to say it's uh it's easy. Would you change your platform? Um, I, is that out of context? What do you mean when I change my platform? I think that I've tweaked things over the years, but if you go back to the original books that were written 15 years ago or however long ago, nothing's really changed. I'm still doing the same exact thing today. Now, my entries might be a little bit more liberal to avoid false moves. My stops might be a little wider because markets seem to be a little choppier. But that's just the typical cycles in the market. That's all that is. You said your stops were not triggering. Okay, no, I think I was talking about uh, on an entry, okay? So let's let's take a look at that. Let's, let's take a look at the um, – what I'm saying is let's say you have a market that looks like this. And that's going to be your entry. Well, you could actually put in a stop. Let's say the market opens up around here somewhere. You could actually put it a stop. Go have lunch, okay? Take the wife out or your husband out, okay? And if this market does this, then no capital is put into harm's way. 
I am surprised, especially this year, how many losing trades I have missed by simply waiting for that stop entry order to trigger. Okay. What is ample time with the system? It depends on the system. Okay. Um, go in and do the research and make sure you gain the confidence. And then, you know, the key, the secret, I think, is looking for the bad. And I know we're trained in life not to look for the bad, but sometimes you have to look for the bad. There's two types of personality. There's a toward personality and there's a way personality. And I tend to be a toward personality. I probably don't fully uh, understand the risk of things involved. My wife, she's, she's a, she has a little bit of that away personality. Her nickname is Sergeant Safety. She, she kind of looks at as to what could go wrong with things. Well, you have to sort of pick things apart and look at what things, how things could kind of go wrong when it comes to markets, because we're all excited. We all want to, to, to make as much money as we can, but we also have to look at what could go wrong. Somebody once said, this is a system, and, and I, I'll never forget what I told him. I said, let me get this right. You're risking 16 ticks to make four ticks. <laughs> and that's what they were doing, and that's obviously not a good thing to do. So that's why I'm kind of devil's advocate and go in and kind of pick things apart. All right, good. When you change time frame, do you keep the same system? Yes. Yeah, I think markets are markets. I mean, that's why I'm, again, I'm not suggesting you rush out and do this, but it's just kind of like an SG type of thing. But five minute bow ties in Forex are kind of uh, are kind of fun to mess around with a little bit. And I've been kind of messing around with that just for SGs. Uh, my main focus obviously remains stocks. I think the, the inefficient markets, such as stocks, that's where the real money is. But, yeah, you could change. We're going to look at a weekly bow tie here in one minute, okay? So you have to stick to a time frame. I believe in daily – I think the daily bars are the way to go, and then hopefully that daily bar turns into a longer, long-term trend. The reason I'm not trading off a weekly bar is because by the time you get that weekly move, it may be too late. However, if you're looking at something like an index, you need to pay attention to what's going on a weekly basis just in case you have some sort of – I don't know if the word secular is the right word, but some sort of secular bull market in the making or worse, unfortunately, possibly right now, secular bear market in the making. Okay. Great questions. <laughs> Assessing odds, job description of a trader. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, you, you, you do obviously have to be uh, – an optimist in life. I mean, I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out, right? But you do have to be an optimist in life. You do have to be an optimist even in the trading world, but you also have to remember to think about what could go wrong and how would you deal with it. Again, can you can you trade a system into, you know, we, we I was talking about Mr. Faith earlier, and people criticize him because he lost a lot of money, but he also made a lot of money, okay, by taking on those enormous risks. It, it, you know, I think trading contests are, 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 are a bad idea, but the way you win a trading contest, and I'm not going to pick on anyone in particular, but there's a, there's a certain formula that's out there that suggests you should risk a lot of money if you think your system has uh, a, a certain percent correct. You divide percent by correct or whatever. And you risk a huge amount of money. And there was one gentleman who won a trading contest by doing that. But he also lost half of the money by year end, even though he still won the contest. I think he probably would have lost. I think he would have blown up if he would have kept trading the system. Okay? But you can't take away the fact that he won the contest and made a whole lot of money. So you have to be careful and you have to make sure you understand that risk and analyze that risk. I've never met a rich pessimist, Bill O'Neill. Yeah. Okay. Woody Allen may be an exception. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I think we've got to beat the psychological dead horse. <laughs> uh, I think you get the idea. 
Now, this is a little bit more advanced, and like I said earlier, I've done a lot of volatility research in the past, and volatility fascinated me early in my career because catching trends is hard, and volatility can be more predictable than price in some cases. And so I, I kind of went off onto the volatility stand for a while. I never did give up on on the trend trading ever, but I've dabbled in quite a few things over the years. And the good thing is I did, you know, I tell you, to, I tell you not to go out and chase holy grails and do all these things. But then I think unless you do those things, you don't understand markets fully. So it's kind of a chicken and the egg type of thing. It's a very expensive journey to take, by the way. But if you look at the volatility, volatility tends to wax and wane, and it tends to uh, compress. It tends to be cyclical, okay? And one thing that's kind of interesting is not only does it revert to the mean, meaning that if it stretches to where the mean is the average, if it stretches away from it, it tends to come back, but it also tends to overshoot, okay? So notice in this particular case here, this is a six-day historical volatility divided by 50-day historical volatility. And I'll give you those formulas if you want them. Everything I do is fully disclosed. But you can see that volatility kind of overshoots to the upside after it drops off, and then it kind of dries up to the downside. Now, when the volatility does begin to dry up, I actually no longer plot this unless I'm just doing it for uh, examples like now. I just eyeball it, and I'd say, okay, here's a close, there's a close, there's a close, there's a close, there's a close. And it, it just in my mind's eye, I kind of connect the closes. You can see that. Those closes are really, really tight in here, okay? So I know that this volatility has begun to compress. If you think about it, traders don't agree for long. So when the market starts quieting down, it means that everybody's at agreement, and that usually doesn't happen long. Some sort of catalyst comes into a market, or somebody changes their mind, and then all of a sudden the market begins to move. Now, with volatility, you have to watch because sometimes that first move is a false one. So you could say, okay, well, volatility is really tight here. I'm just going to trade this breakout because it's going to be expansion of volatility. Unfortunately, that first move, as you can see in this particular case, was a false one. Now, in an ideal world, what I was kind of – my gut was that we would take off like this and then implode, okay? So it's a little bit trickier now. The move was much smaller than I kind of anticipated, and now we're headed back down. So the volatility is beginning to expand, and again, we had that false move. Um, I'm not a, I don't suggest you run out and trade off of this, although it will test out. I've tested it before, and it will test out these volatility expansions. I mean, if there's something you want to get into, that's fine. I mean, I, I played around with it for quite a bit. I wrote an article in 1996, I think. I'm beginning to date myself. Uh, in stocks and commodities, I call it the volatility trade and goal, where you were looking to go both ways. Uh, but the, the made trade came after the fake out to the upside. Okay. Um, so it's a very short-term thing. I don't suggest you rush out and trade it. But it, these type of things can help you when analyzing the market. So you don't get too excited about this close that's above all these closes here. Okay. You, you tend to be a little bit more skeptical when you know these things. So the volatility began to expand, and then you take the move the opposite way, or just watch for a fake out, okay? <laughs> you wrote an article in the last century, wow. <laughs> Real money in longer term, but can you rely on conditions of markets being reproductive over longer term? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you look at, you look at, you look at what the stock market has done since 2009, and, um, that tells you right there that that markets will trend longer term. You have to take a longer term approach. Okay, I was uh, looking at my slides from the last week of charts, which was a couple of weeks back, and I was still talking about the, the possible bear market. And the question is, has anything changed since then? And obviously, we've had some zigs and zags, but I don't think a whole lot has changed just yet. So the question is... Um, are we out of the woods or back into the woods? Have everyone look at it. Part four. And I guess now that Hong Kong is my next uh, place of uh, place to visit, I'll have to use a little uh, Chinese symbol for four. Anyway, uh, back on December 23rd, I did a little uh, video on 
fact that we could be entering into a bear market. And I didn't know that for the fact. And obviously, as a trend follower, I have to wait and not anticipate too much. And part of my concern was the fact that we had this weekly bow tie down right here. And it triggered right here. But what has the market done since? It's kind of going straight back up. But here's the thing, and I was having a hard time explaining this. So let me try one more time. When you have all-time highs and you get a signal, and that signal triggers, that top remains in place until it gets taken out. Okay? So until the market trades up here, this top remains in place. Okay? I'm not saying that... You could necessarily trade off that and stay short to the gills. Maybe you do have to get out of the way long before the market makes new highs. But my point is, if you go back and look at all the major tops, bonds, the euro, uh, gold, okay, they all had these major bow tie tops on the weekly chart. And those tops were never exceeded. Now, it might have been a bumpy ride, kind of like the peas. You know, you get a trigger goes up, and then you know, it might be, it might do like that. But until that top gets taken out, that top remains in place based on this signal. Okay, so I would be very cautious with this market again until that top gets taken out. This might not be the top. I don't know. Okay. If I knew for sure, it always knew for sure, that as I often say, you never see my fat ass again. But if you're looking at these, these weekly signals, these major signals off of all-time highs, again, go look at gold. Go look at, you can look at any market. They're going to have a bow tie or a similar emerging trend pattern, like a first thrust. And until that high gets taken out, that top remains in place. Does that make sense? <laughs> and your arse would be even fatter, I suspect. Yeah, I probably would. Uh, I would. Ha I would have to worry about keeping myself so busy and moving around so much. Okay, any questions on the uh, DiCaprio met the bear? What does that mean? I have no idea what that means. Definitely makes sense. Cool. Uh, good. Okay. So, yeah, because I must have did a bad job trying to explain this at some point, but. And even if you do get a minor bow tie in here, so let's say your top comes down, you got a bow tie signal here, and then let's say you get a bow tie here. Well, this is a major signal. This is a minor signal. And this major signal remains in place again until that top gets taken out. Okay. All right. Uh, I got asked to look at Pack B. I thought it would be better if I just uh, made a slide of it. And if you guys, uh, I got a couple more things to cover, but if you guys want to start asking about individual issues, you can do that now. I'm going to go over the market real quick, and then we'll look at a few sectors, and we'll jump out to the uh, individual stocks. The first thing I see, if I back this chart way out, I thought it'd be good to back the chart way out. I always back the chart way out, and this is a stock that implodes, takes off, implodes, takes off, chops around, takes off, implodes, takes off, implodes, takes off, implodes. So it's kind of a bit of an electrocardiogram. As you can see. Now, keep in mind that with markets, it's a very fluid situation. Things change, okay? So just because a stock traded all over the place in the past doesn't mean that it's not going to trade all over the place in the future. It may begin to have some structure. It might be worth trading. And I think that's why I got an email on that because it does look like it's shaping up. My concern, though, is it's not an orderly trend that looks like this, okay, and then one that's kind of accelerated and just looks nice and beautiful like that. The trend is it just kind of took off over a few days, consolidated, then it took off again. So I'm not a huge fan of markets that where the trend is just over a very brief period of time. And in this particular case, it pretty much doubled over a very short period of time. And you frame that within the caveat of, or I said you frame that within the, um, what am I looking for? Word, within the realm of how the stock acts longer term. 
And so I'm having a hard time getting getting excited about a stock that looks like this. And then even if you are excited about it, then you need to ask yourself, well, what's the overall market doing? The overall market's kind of questionable. Most stocks are, are choppy at best. Most areas are stalling short of their own high, old highs. So do I really want to put capital in harm's way? In this particular case, I just don't think it's worth it. Okay. And again, if you look at this, this is really just one huge day in here. You know, I guess two if you count that, where it, it jumped about what 40% over a few days. So I think I would leave this one alone. It's all over the place, and most of the trend is with just, just within a few days. Now, if you had a long, 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 long term base and you had a couple of wide range bars, that's a different story. But this stock tends to just trade in these huge wide range bars all over the place, okay? And the same thing on the downside here, too. Is it up one, an up one, a down one, a down one? an up one here, you know, it did follow through, but sometimes you just have to be willing to pass on a trade. And this is a case where I would suggest you do just that. Okay. Did you come across pack B through your scan? Um, yeah, it came up in the scans. It always, uh, because anytime a market makes a new high and pulls back, it'll come up in my scans and I'll give you the scans. Okay. Oh, I am doing some podcasting. I'm still working at Kings out. They're not, my recordings aren't the best in the world, but uh, I'm getting better on that. So uh, check my website for more on that. All right, let's go ahead and hop out to the charts. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and use, um, I like black charts, but obviously I'm going to change my price color. All right, getting back to the P's. And again, this wasn't a huge breakout or fake out. I would have preferred if it had gone way up here and then come back down. Then I could say, aha, that's a fake out. So again, this market has just been tough all year. It has not been an easy market. But you can see that, I guess let's go to the S&P 500. You get a little bit cleaner chart with the P's. You can see that so far we've kind of slid. We're still only short of this prior high in here. We're, short, we're still only short of this longer term high in here. So I would remain skeptical about the overall market. If you didn't know anything about markets and all you had was like a net net change, you can go all the way back to last September, last November, whatever. And depending on what day of the week it is, the market is either slightly higher or about where it was, especially if you go back a little bit further, a little bit later in the year, you go back to, let's say, last Thanksgiving, okay? So last Thanksgiving, the market is actually slightly negative from where we are now. So even if you don't know anything about markets, you can say, well, wait a minute. This looked like, this uptrend looked good. This looked like sideways, okay? So if you didn't know anything about markets, but you knew how to, to do net net change, like what's the price a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, what's the price today? Connect the dots, okay? So at the least, this market has gone sideways for about a year. And again, it's stalling short of its old highs. Now we take a look at the Rusty. And the Rusty kind of had a minor breakout a couple days ago, but then it's already come right back into this range. And I've already got it drawn in for you. I think we can go back to 2013, believe it or not. And you can see, depending on what day you pick in 2013, and whether it's up or down recently, let's see if we can get it. There you go. Last December, around Christmas, it's up 2.5%. I'm sorry, 2013. So that's two years without a whole lot of forward progress. And we had a two-day bow tie. Let's see when the weekly bow tie triggered. Um, we had a one-day bow tie, a two-day bow tie, and a weekly bow tie down. And like I said at the S&P 500, this top from this bow tie, which triggered here, will remain in place until this top gets taken out. Okay? Not that you necessarily could trade off of that. But that is going to be your top until it gets taken out. Now, 
if the market drops like it did in 2008, then you know this top you would you would trade off of the of the bottom, okay? Like the, the bottom at 03. Notice that you had a bow tie bottom. You had a bow tie down here, but then you had one back up here, okay? So yeah, this top remains in place until it gets taken out, but you don't wait that long once you have a significant drop. Just like in 2007, 2008, you don't wait for the market to take out this new high before you get long again, okay? So if we do end up dropping significantly, once you get weighed out here, you're not waiting for this top to get taken out to prove that the top no longer is, is valid. But in the early phases of the trend, as that trend begins to emerge, until that top gets taken out, that top remains in place, okay? All right, let's take a look. There's only a couple of areas I want to look at real quick. A um, couple of interesting developments. Let's take a look at bonds real quick. Um, so here on bonds, you had kind of a first thrust here. So this top remains in place, again, until that top gets taken out, okay, until this makes new highs. And you can see bonds in general have kind of rolled over. And today they're getting smacked. Now, what's kind of fascinating is yesterday I noticed that real estate got whacked in here a couple of percent. And yesterday I noticed in here that utilities got whacked pretty hard. These are interest rate sensitive areas, but bonds are going higher. So that's why you have to look at everything when it comes to markets. Because even though because even though markets, the bonds were headed higher, these interest rate sensitive areas got whacked. And that's why it's good to do all this analysis every night. So it doesn't surprise me that bonds are getting whacked in here today. Um, as I would say, quite a bit. A lot of areas have stalled well short of their old highs. And so far, still look like they're in a lot of trouble. Uh, drugs, health services. And then even the areas that got a little bit closer to their old highs have stalled out. And at the least, like leisure, you can see it's all over the place. And take a look at, like, some of these areas that actually made it to new highs are coming right back in. So this is not an easy market. It's a market that you probably mostly want to be sitting on your hands and possibly firing off a short or two. Okay. So I don't want to get I don't want to go into too much more detail. I think between the column and and uh, what I just said, you kind of got the idea that the market's not completely healthy just yet. Okay. Okay. Why not take it as top and place major stop above short the hell out of the market, Joe T. Well, you could, you you know, you could, and, and, and if you could wrap your head around that, and you could say, okay, uh, we're going to short the hell out of this market, and we're going to stop out at the new high. Yeah, I mean, you could do that. I mean, even if you were trading, let's say you were trading on a shorter term time frame, and say, okay, I'm going to take bow ties, and then my stop's going to go above the highs. I think you could do. I think you would do just fine. Okay. But on, I think on a weekly basis, that's pretty tough to just keep shorting and shorting and shorting, even though the market's it's trying to get back to those old highs. Sometimes you'll get that second signal too, okay? Let's, you might get a double. If you get a double bow tie in here, then, then load the boat. That might be the time to load the boat. But, yeah, that's fine as long as if you're okay with that and say, okay, I don't care. I'm going to have a stop it above those old highs, and I've got my risk in place, and I know that I might be wrong. That's fine, okay. Okay, no, that's a bad idea. The market always goes back up. Well, the market doesn't always go back up. Why not double down every 200 points? No, no, that's a bad idea. Uh, doubling down will work until it don't, okay? Uh, that's called a martingale system where you just keep doubling down. you got to be really careful. I think that's what they call it. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. you got to be really careful if you're uh, if you low. I think you should place a trade. And then have a stop in place if you're wrong, good, bad, or indifferent. I, I think it's very dangerous to start doubling up and all. All right, Richard wants to know about Hawk. I'm going to watch that stock like a hawk. Um, well, it's kind of wide and loose, obviously. And it did kind of peep up a little bit, but it really wasn't that serious of a breakout. Let's let's This line's a little bit too low in here. So it just barely got past its prior peaks. It's already pulled back. So I would leave that alone. Again, wide and loose. Really didn't clear the prior peaks that well, so avoid that one for now. Now, again, now's now's a time where 
you're not going to be that impressed because you're going to think, oh, Dave hates everything. Does somebody want to Dave the stock? Yeah, which way is the stock headed? Anybody know? Anybody smart enough in here to know? Down, right? <laughs> SWHC. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, well, I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but with all that's going on in the world, this is kind of an interesting uh, stock. But this is tends to be just a choppy stock, and it tends to trade in chunks. You know, it, it had a big gap higher, and then it kind of drifted, and it took off, and then it came back in, and then a big gap higher. So I don't like the personality of this stock. I've been asked a lot about this stock throughout the years. I live in the South where we all have a bunch of guns. Um, crime's a little bit lower because we just shoot people. Uh, if everybody had a gun, people wouldn't run around shooting people, right, because they know they might get shot back. Anyway, that's a that's an argument for another time. <laughs> I avoid politics, so if you guys have convinced uh, other arguments, that's that's fine. But it's wide and loose. It's sideways. It would have to break out, okay, of this consolidation, and then maybe on a pullback. But right now, I would leave it alone. Even if all you do about it, again in trading is net net, what's that? Three months, three and a half months, three months of sideways movement. So. It doesn't look like something that's trending or should be uh, bought at this point. Fizz for art. F I Z Z. Okay. Uh, super duper thin stock. So be super careful. As a private trader, yeah, you might be able to go in and do something with this, but just very dangerous. Uh, it's at a solid trend. At this juncture, it might be priced for perfection meaning that it's had such a good run, and they're not splitting the atom, right? If it's a biotech stock, maybe a biotech stock could run 200% and then run another 200%. But what are they doing? They're some sort of drinks or something. I don't know. I'm guessing soft drinks. So I'd have a hard time getting excited about this one. It also, this last little move higher is just this one big wide range bar. If you're long, stay long, but I would avoid it. It's too dangerous. You are correct on Martin. Could you look at the transports? Absolutely. Let's take a look at the trannies. The trannies are kind of all over the place. Looks like I have a line drawn in here. I'd be willing to bet that's probably on a weekly or something. Um, sometimes when a market isn't very clear, pop out to a weekly or even a monthly. And you can see that we've gone sideways in here. We've rolled over. And so far, we've just kind of in this retrace mode. So I don't think the transport's looking so hot. Let's put the bow ties in, and let's take a look at a weekly. You had a daily bow tie way back here off of all-time highs. Again, this top remains in place until it gets taken out. And on a weekly basis, much cleaner, okay? And again, this top remains in place until it gets taken out. You know, as I said recently, the 50-week moving average. Somebody was asking me about simple systems. I'm not saying rush out and trade this, but you could probably do a lot worse. Notice the slope is mostly negative in this 50-week moving average. Okay, back to chart way out. Notice the slope was mostly positive in this 50-week moving average, okay? You see what I'm saying? So the trend looks like it might be turning here. And this top, again, remains in place until what? Until it gets taken out. Susan's still dreaming of me. Susan, you got to cut that out. you gotta, you gotta make, you got to mess me up. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate that. Poor Susan having nightmares. <laughs> you have to go back a couple of shows before for that to make sense. XLE, Bottom and Energies, you still think? Maybe not. Um. I think the energies are bottoming. I just think they're taking forever to bottom. Let's take a look at this. Uh, XLE. I think since we're on a weekly, let's take a look at the weekly. I think the downtrend on a weekly is is still in place here. Let's take a look at the daily chart. But you can see it's kind of trying to bottom in here, but it looks like it wants to come down to challenge its old lows. Uh, if you take a look at energies basis, the Morningstar Industry Groups, which I like to look at, I'm sorry, that's electronics. Where's the energies? If I can find them. Major MIGs, here we go. Talk amongst yourselves. There we go. 
you can see that the major MIGs are coming off of major, major lows in here, okay? Now, I wouldn't rush out and short them just because they're in a longer-term downtrend, but I, I think they're trying to bottom out in here. But as I said a while back, it's becoming a process more than an event. We went long USO. It failed miserably. I think there might have been another energy stock somewhere in there that we might have gotten long. It didn't work. But that's okay because eventually – we're going to get some more signals in here, and then we'll look to buy after that. Metals and mining, same sort of thing, but even worse. Metals and mining are just kind of scraping bottom in here. But when they turn, it might be worth a shot, but wait for the turn, okay? How about IBB? Thanks. Biotech ETF. Yeah, um, that's the NASDAQ Biotechs. Um, it's kind of sideways, shorter term. It's obviously coming unglued a little bit today, a little bit. If you look at the longer term chart, though, you had this big thrust down in a pullback and then that triggered. So this top remains in place until what? Until proven else or otherwise. You can see you did have a daily bow tie. Let's take a look at a weekly chart. And you can see that we did have a bow tie on a weekly chart, which just triggered recently in here. Okay. It's kind of interesting, you know, here's the problem. You do have some longer-term lag. Notice that this 50-week moving average is still headed higher, but we have crossed below it, and the weekly bow ties have crossed down. So any trade follow indicator is going to have some lag. PBF? PBF. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, this caught my eye a few days ago. Um, in fact, it was on yesterday's list, but I didn't publish the list because it hadn't pulled back enough yet. Uh, maybe at a little bit more pullback. Unfortunately, if it pulls back much further, then you're pulling back below to where it broke out. Um, this is a refiner. I guess refiners are going to do better with lower energy prices, so this is kind of a little counterintuitive. But if I am going after an energy stock, I'd be more excited about an energy stock that looks like the overall sector down towards those old lows than I would be um, at one way up here, okay? Okay, SNA. Um, this one, this one just kind of barely got past its prior peaks in here. So I wouldn't be too excited about it just yet. I mean, if it, it really cleared these peaks in here, then maybe on a pullback I'd be interested in it. But right now, um, I'm not too excited about it just yet. Thanks, Dave. Wasn't aware of weekly bow tie on it. Oh, you're welcome. RCL, and I'm, I'm bearish on these cruise lines. Not because I'm thinking about what's going on in the world, but they look like they could be in trouble. Um, this one's a little choppy in here, but it does look like it's in trouble. It has kind of thrust lower. It is kind of triggering. But I, I would rush out and short it, but it does look like it's in trouble, okay? FCX, sorry, I was away. No problem. That's going to be Freeport MacMoron. Okay. Uh, like the rest of the metals and mining, it's just kind of bottoming out in here. I would rush out and sell it short, even though it remains in a downtrend. But you could see the mother of all bottoms here at some point in time. But wait for that signal. Right now, I'd probably have to get above 12 for me to get excited about it because you have all that overhead supply. Great review. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. Greg wants to know about AZS. Thanks for waiting, Greg, on that. AZS. Uh, it's it's sort of a, it's not thin. It's it behaves like a like a very low price issue. Um. Yeah, it's kind of bottomed out here. It's kind of got some strange trading uh, in it. It it has bow tied. Most of your move is over just a couple days in here, but when you're coming off of major lows like this, uh, you, sometimes you have that. I think it looks okay. I, I just don't – I can't wrap my head around this uh, – the way it trades in here. It kind of trades in it. I don't know why it trades like that. It's trade, The trading bars look like a thin, choppier issue. I'm not sure why it's doing that, but I think it looks okay. Susan wants to know about BABA. 
Well, Bob was sort of triggered out of this cup and handle, but now it's kind of hitting this uh, second peak in here. It did make the bow tie up, and then I guess you're, you had a signal here. You, it did have some overhead supply to it. It's an incredibly thick stock. Look at the – I can't even add two zeros to that. Two billion shares? Is that what, 20 billion a day? Something crazy. So it's a little too uh, thick for me to get excited about, but sometimes these things could set up. But I would leave it alone now because it hasn't taken out its prior little peak in here. If you are long, I'd stay long in that one. You're welcome, Bars. NSA? NSA. Uh, yeah, this is breaking out to new highs. This has caught my eye in here, maybe on a pullback, okay? It's a tiny bit on the thin side. It is a relatively new issue. So, yeah, maybe on a pullback. Uh, National Storage Affiliates Trust, uh, are they uh, REIT? What do they do? Uh, HLI for Jerry. On oh, a pullback, yeah, that looks pretty good. HLI for Jerry. Um, I've never heard of this stock. Uh, let's see. It's a relatively new issue, but it, it didn't come public with a whole lot of excitement. This is only a two-point move in here. I think I would pass on this uh, unless it really made some serious move higher, maybe well into the – high 20s and then pull back i mean i hear you it's not bad but the the range is 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 kind of tight for an ipo it seems like you should have a little more excitement but you could do a lot worse i mean yeah it did break out of its range it is pulling back but it just doesn't have that this is only a one point range in here but i hear you it's it's not you could do much worse i can't read the stock symbols in the upper left corner it's, it's too dim um Okay, well, I don't know what I can do about that. I'll just tell you what symbol we're on, uh, Cliff. I don't know how to fix that. Um, okay, GCI, that's going to be uh, Garnett or something. GCI, Garnett. Um, I don't know what happened back here. This looks kind of questionable. Let's zoom in a little bit. Maybe it's because it's – maybe it's an IPO. Let's zoom in. That's probably what it is, the reuse symbol. Um, it's working its way higher, but it, it hasn't made much forward progress. It had to accelerate higher again for me to get excited about it. FSB, did we cover that one? David says, it looks like there are bow ties and then the market takes for off 2011, for example. Okay, we'll go back to that and look at it. Um, you had a bow tie in 2011, but was it a major bow tie? Yeah, this looks okay. Maybe a little bit deeper pullback. It's real thin, though. Okay, the problem with a little bit deeper pullback is now you're back to this breakout here. But yeah, it, it looks okay. A slightly deeper pullback, but again, too thin. Well, if you look at the market, if I can get it to come up. Okay. So you're saying we had a bow tie in 2011? Yeah, you know, not every signal is going to turn into a major top. Now, yeah, if you look at 2011, now, a major bow tie is off of all-time highs, okay? So in 2011, you did have a bow tie, but it wasn't off of all-time highs, okay? So it's still a signal, but not a huge signal. And then you did have – it did begin to roll over a little bit in here, but as everybody knows, the market turned around in 2011. It went back up. This is off of all-time highs, so this signal is a little bit more significant than this one. I would call this a minor signal, not that you should ignore it. If memory serves, we got stopped out of our longs back here, and then the market went back up. That's okay. And we got a few shorts. We got stopped out of those. Market went back up. That's okay. Okay? But, yeah, you did have one absolutely in a weekly in 2011. Again, not off of all-time highs, off of multi-year highs, but not off of all-time highs, and it didn't materialize, okay? OCLR, you're welcome, Alan. OCLR, kind of a choppy one, kind of all, you know, big gaps, big, uh, huge move downs, kind of all over the place, break it out a little bit. That's a one-day, two-day chart, sorry. Uh, but it's just, just kind of all over the place. But, yeah, beginning to break out here, maybe if it follows through on a pullback. EBS for Howard. Uh, no, no. Well, maybe soon. It's bottoming, okay? But in this particular case, I'd wait for a bow tie. Wait for it to break out. I mean, yeah, put that on your watch list for sure. 
But when you back the chart out, you can see it's just kind of bottoming out. You will have a little bit resistance along the way, but this might be worth for worth watching for a bottoming pattern, emerging trend pattern, I should say, such as a first thrust on bow tie. But all energies pretty much fit this uh, thing. Oh, you want to look at IYT? No problem, Andre. IYT, YT. Yeah, transports basis IYT, choppy, shorter term, break it down, shorter term. Uh, there's your daily bow tie here. You kind of had multiple bow ties before it finally broke down. On a weekly basis, remember, when in doubt, look a little further out. What do we have? Negative slope for the most part in the 50-week moving average. Uh, a bow tie down, a first thrust down, kind of a first thrust in here, okay? So falling tops. So this market looks like a market that's in trouble. This top remains in place unless it gets taken out. So, yeah, that looks like it's still in trouble. VLRS. VLRS. Yeah, this looks okay. Um, well, let me take that back. On a weekly basis, it looks okay. But I don't like the fact that it broke out and then it came back in to where it broke out from. If you're long, stay long. But for me to get excited, it would have to break out to new highs and stay there. Okay, we've got a couple – give a couple more in in the lightning round. HLI? Don't know it. Yeah, we just talked about that one. Sorry. ALNY and then Netflix. That will be the last one for today. Um, yeah, this is kind of bottoming out in here. But it's kind of all over the place, and it's not coming off of, like, 10-year lows or anything. So I'd have a hard time getting excited about it. Um, and then you got a lot of overhead supply, and you got a big gap down. It's kind of wide and loose, so I would leave that I leave that one alone. Netflix is a big, thick stock. I'm not really crazy about trading these huge stocks, although they can occasionally provide shorting opportunities. And it's just kind of barely break it out to do high. So, yeah, if you're tracking your momentum list, it should go on your momentum list. But I would rush out and buy it just yet. Okay, it looks like my time is more than over, uh, more than up, I should say. Uh, as you know, I have a blast through these shows. So thank you guys, for, hey, girls, uh, for showing up. I appreciate you taking time on your busy schedule to be here. I'm obviously humbled by your appearance. I do have a blast doing these, and that's why I like to do them so much. And, and as long as you guys and girls show up, I'll continue to do them. So thank you so much. Um, if uh, any other answer questions, shoot me an email, daviddavelander.com. And I guess uh, we'll talk again uh, next week. Uh, if we don't uh, talk between now and then, everybody have a great weekend. and hope to see all you guys and girls in here again next week. Thanks again. Thanks so much.